I want to welcome you um, to the first Women in Management Speaker Series, our headline event. We are really pleased to have Heidi Roizen with us today. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few logistics. I'm going to do a quick introduction and then turn it over to Margot Langsdorf, who is the president of Women in Management. She's going to do a fireside chat. After the formal Q&A, we'll turn it over to you. If you have a question you'd like to po pose, please raise your hand, and much like view from the top, we'll pass you a microphone. Um, and with that, uh, I think we're going to begin. Heidi Roizen has spent her life immersed in the Silicon Valley ecosystem. As an entrepreneur, corporate executive, venture capitalist, and member of several boards. After receiving her undergraduate and MBA degrees from Stanford University, Heidi co-founded co TeamMaker Company, an early personal computer software company in 1983. She served as the CEO from inception through its acquisition by Deluxe Corporation in 1994. In 1996, Heidi joined Apple as Vice President of Worldwide Developer Relations. From there, Heidi entered the venture capital world, serving as man Managing Director of Mobius Venture Capital from 1999 to 2007. Today, Heidi splits her time between her entrepreneurial endeavor, Skinny Songs, and board service in the public, private, and nonprofit se sectors. In 2008, Heidi was named the Annual Achievement Award winner by the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs and Executives. She is married and has two children. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Margot, and I please ask that you help me in joining or in join me in welcoming Heidi. Heidi, on behalf of Women in Management and the entire GSB community, we're thrilled to have you here. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. It's always fun to come back here. Although I still have those nightmares about, you know, I, I'm taking class and I didn't really study for it, and then I get here and I don't know where the final is, and then you get there and it's in like Chinese. And like that. So I, I still have those dreams, and I wake up and I say, no, wait, I've graduated. I don't have to think about that anymore. So, so in the latest evolution of your career, how do you feel your network continues to play a role in your personal success and development? Um, well, it, it's an interesting question because I have two very different halves to my career right now. I have the, as my daughter calls it, my fake job and my real job. <laughs> and in my fake job, Skinny Songs, um, that is, you know, is a crazy idea that I came up with. It's very entrepreneurial. I really decided to throw myself at that and, and learn about the music industry and create this album of music, and I, I don't play an instrument, I don't sing, I can't read music, um, so I was really not very well qualified for that job. But I was passionate about the idea, I was passionate about what I wanted to get across from a lyrics perspective, and so then I had to do what you typically do when you're an entrepreneur and you have a great idea, but you're not the one who can execute. You go find people much better than you are, you talk them into the idea, and you get them to come along with it. So in that case, networking was really interesting because my network was not, I don't like hang with an Asheville crowd, you know, so <laughs> for me it was figuring out who did I know who knew somebody who knew somebody and then how could I get the pitch done and how could I use my credibility in the valley to translate somewhere else. Now, I will say I had one tremendous advantage that most people in the music business don't have is A, I could fund the project myself, although I couldn't pay everybody the full kind of salaries that they get paid to do this, but I had enough money that if I could convince them to do it for royalties, I could, I could get it off the ground. And B, I did not need to make a living in the music industry, because trust me, well, if that's your plan, <laughs> have, a, have a backup <laughs> plan, because uh, the music industry is kind of not exactly a great place to make money. And so, um, so I kind of knew that to be the case, but I felt that this was something that I could get to sustainability and profitability and I really wanted to, to, to try it out. So in that case, my network was, was valuable in some ways. In some ways, obviously, there, aren't, you know, there, were, there are no connections. And, and the other thing that's interesting is contextually, everyone will take your calls when you're a venture capitalist and you're in Silicon Valley and you have hot startups and, 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 and they want to raise money from you. When you're hawking a musical product and you call up the vice president at Weight Watchers because you've figured out who they are on LinkedIn and you have a friend three levels removed, they aren't necessarily that psyched to take your call. So one of the interesting things that, that I discovered is that <laughs> you know credibility and power doesn't necessarily translate into a different world. 
and you have to be ready to kind of start from scratch and, and really do this stuff over and over again. Although one of the funniest things, and, it, and actually it relates to Weight Watchers, at weightwatchers.com, the guy who ran sort of the weightwatchers.com web analytics and, and, and sort of the, the stuff that was important over there for that, he was in the, the email traffic with, with me and the people I was trying to pitch at Weight Watchers and it turned out he had gone to business school, not here, but I think Columbia, and they had done my case. And so I will just tell you this, never in a million years when I did that case did I think that it would end up having so much benefit to me because you're like this weird quasi-celebrity when you have a Harvard case about, about you and people really do pay attention to that stuff. And so the guy sent me a note and he said, by the way, I read your case, I really loved it. And so then I had a buddy and he was really helpful at getting me some premium placement and letting the ad run for a few extra days and stuff like that. So you do discover that sometimes in the strangest places there will be a connection that you don't expect there to be. On the other side, uh, the other thing I'm doing right now, my, my real job, as my daughter calls it, is I'm doing corporate governance. And I'd be happy to talk at more length about that or talk about why I chose it. Um, I, can, I can tell you why in sort of a really short uh, thing. I didn't want to have a full-time job anymore. I love working with people to build something. I really like the challenges of, of being part of a corporation. And um, public company governance is a really interesting field right now because in some ways people are running away from it in droves. So <laughs> it's a growth opportunity. And, uh, and they do actually pay you money to do, to do that. So you can, you can have fun and make money at the same time, be involved with interesting people, and you can assemble a portfolio of things and still work from home and drive your kids to school and do all that other kind of stuff. So it's, it's interesting work and it, it, it fits very well with sort of this phase of my life and, and where, where I'm going. I'll tell you again, you know, there is no monster.com for getting, getting board of director positions. And interestingly, more than 70%, more than 75% of all board of director positions in, in the biggest companies in America are filled without the use of a headhunter. It's really done by word of mouth. It's the governance committee sits around and they say, who do you know? Well, I don't know, who do you know? and they network out through their friends and so it is, it is very much a situation of using a network. But it's, it is a very odd thing in the sense that, first of all, you don't know when these positions come up. They start recruiting for them way ahead of time. You, even if you have a best friend who knows that you're on two other boards, when they're sitting in that corporate governance committee meeting and they say, who do we know? Your name does not pop in their head immediately as this perfect person. So you have to let your own network know. And so one day last February, I decided I needed to really push my network a little bit. And I sat down and over the course of about eight hours, I wrote 150 something individual emails to everybody I knew that I knew well enough who was on a board, who was in a service organization for a board, you know, for example, an attorney or an accountant or um, a recruiter or whatever, or a CEO or a CTO level, CXO level person in a company saying, hey, remember, here I am, I made it easy, here are my board qualifications, here's a URL to my website about me and board service, if you know of anybody looking for a board member, let me know. And, you know, lo and behold, one of the boards I now sit on, TiVo, it just so happened that, you know, later that evening I went to a cocktail party and there was a venture capitalist that I'd served on a board with 10 years ago and he's on the TiVo board and he's leaving the TiVo board and he said, ah, you'd be perfect for that board. I never would have thought of you. Thank God you sent me that email. And then, oh, by the way, thank God I ran into you at this party tonight and that's how that process started. So, so do not believe, so I, I guess my, my uh, the point of all of that is do not believe that just because you've been around for a long time and everybody knows you and you're 50 something years old, that you don't still have to work at it and you don't have to do the homework and you don't have to make it easy for other people to connect the dots with and for you because you still, you still have to do the work and I'm still doing the work. So you mentioned the power of networking and I imagine for someone like you, networking may come very easily, but what are your recommendations for shyer students that are looking to grow their network as they leave the GSB? Well, first of all, I don't think networking is necessarily easy for people. I am, I'm definitely, <laughs> definitely a talker, you can probably tell, and I like people. So for me, it's a little bit easier to walk into a room and, you know, have conversations with people. But it isn't, 
it isn't a, a something that, you know, every day I'm just the last, the, the first thing I want to do when I get up in the morning is go down to Starbucks and meet everybody else in the line or something. I mean, I, I do, um, I do, I do recommend that you, you know, you don't want to walk in a room and meet everybody in the room. That's not the point. The point is to, to, to come in, have a sense of who the people are, have a sense of what you're trying to accomplish. You only need one good conversation to, to lead to other things. And for example, it's important, again, do homework. I, I recently attended the Fortune Most Powerful Women in Business Conference, and I went through the list of attendees ahead of time, and I figured out who might I like to meet from that list. And, and I looked at not only the attendees, but who are the friends, the people I knew at that conference that even though we live a block from each other, we may not have an opportunity to see each other that often. So I had a kind of sense in my head, okay, these are the 10 people, when I go to this conference of 300 women, these are the 10 I'm gonna try to, to find my way to and meet and, and talk to. I also think that today, a lot of networking occurs in a way that is not, you know, that you don't have to be social. I mean, you don't even have to be dressed. Uh, to do it, right? You know, you're sitting in your pajamas and you're on email and you're, I mean, I always laugh about this because we do a lot of board committee meetings and stuff on the phone and I always think, thank God video conferencing isn't that in yet because half the time I'm sitting there in my bathrobe and, you know, I, I just hope, because they're East Coast, so they have, want to have conference calls at six in the morning. I, I do not look good at six in the morning. So, so I do think that there are also, if you're not a talker person, you can build relationships online. You can build relationships in, in, in different manners. It doesn't have to be, you know, the, the proverbial cocktail party. I think you can build it around uh, nonprofits. You can build it around uh, ad hoc committees, committees here at the school. You can build it around um, various forms of social philanthropy. So there are other ways to go about it and ways that even if you're not, you know, super social, you can do those things. The, 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 the main um, advice I would give you there is don't go out looking for, for pen pals. You know, don't go out looking to collect business cards. To me, the, the hardest thing is I'll get, I'll get email from someone and, and it basically is like, hi, I've read about you, I'd really like to be your pen pal. Can we get together? I'm like, okay, to do what? You know, and you have a conversation and you're sort of done. I think that the best way you get to know other people and the best way they get to know you is in the context of accomplishing something. And whether that is serving on a, on a volunteer committee or whether that is uh, working on a project together or whatever it is, if you can figure out something you can do with someone you want to get to know better, that is a lot better than just uh, stalking them. You know, because at the end of the day, that, that isn't, there isn't going to be really a lot of value delivered if you do that. But switching gears a little, I know that our first year has just read the Heidi Roizen case in their organizational behavior class. Um, and in, in that case, they talked about the experiment of switching your name from Heidi to Howard. Yes. We'd love to hear your reactions to that and what you um, took as a takeaway sure, from that case. Sure, sure, sure. Well, like I say, the case is, has, has, it has a life of its own, and it's pretty funny. And, and about... I get about 10 emails a week from students all across the country who just email me, I'm pretty sure just to see if I respond. Um, and so then I do, and then they're surprised. And, and actually one time it was pretty funny because this guy was having this email exchange with me and he asked me a question or two. He was in class, right? And they were doing the case and he was getting answers from me real time and raising his hand and saying that. I thought, wow, that is creative. I want to hire that guy. Um, but it is, it, so the case is funny because it really does afford this, this, you know, this, like I say, this weird, you know, little niche of, of infamy or whatever it is. And I also want to say, being the subject of a case, I will tell you this. I do have actual friends that I see that have nothing to do with work. And, um, and, 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 and the point is that cases are an abstraction of reality because they're trying to teach you something. And one of the things I find that's interesting about this case is that it, it is controversial at, at some places. What's interesting, when I teach it at Harvard, I've done it, um, I've taught it telephonically at Harvard, and it's controversial because I've decided at Harvard you get graded on creating controversy. And so they make everything controversial. <laughs> um, it's a little less controversial here, but, but there is this, this question people have of me all the time about, you know, how much do you really mix your personal and business life? And on the one hand, I think it's really great to mix your personal and business life because you know, I have a lot of the same, I pick 
people to do business with in a lot of the same way I pick friends. Are they ethical? Are they good people? Are they interesting? You know, and, and so there is a lot of crossover. And I think in the Valley particularly, there's a tremendous amount of crossover. But there are boundaries. And it's one of the things, you know, obviously, the case sort of paints a little bit funnier picture about that, you know, bathing my kids while I'm having a business meeting in the bathroom and stuff like that. You know, it's a little extreme, right, <laughs> relative to reality. I don't do that that often, particularly now that they're 14 and 16. <laughs> really weird. In fact, they don't even let me in the bathroom anymore when, you know, it's, oh, mom, go away. So, uh, but, so the case is, has been really interesting and I've, I've gotten some really um, interesting connections from the case. And this, this thing that came up where, where um, Frank Flynn, who, who taught here for a while actually also, he was at Columbia and he decided to run an experiment where he changed the, the person from Heidi to Howard and then taught two sections of the same, at the same time of a first year class and then he had people go online and rate the, how they felt about Heidi and Howard. And the interesting thing is, um, Heidi and Howard score just as well on effectiveness, but not on like how much you would like this person, how much would you want to work with this person, how much would you trust this person. And when he told me this, so he tracked me down. I didn't know him beforehand. It was actually very funny. My nephew was in, was in at Columbia at the time and was in his class. And because we have such an unusual last name, he said, do you know Heidi Risen? And my nephew said, yeah, that's my aunt. And he said, oh, well, I did this interesting study. I'd love to talk to her about it. And a, a, I was surprised that there was a statistically significant difference between Heidi and Howard. And B, when he asked me, who do you think is doing the biasing, I thought it was the women. And he said, no, it's the men. And the fact that I would even think it was the women, uh, you know, there's so many levels of what's wrong with this picture in, in a lot of this. And so, you know, it, it does, it, it really does amaze me because I would have thought in this day and age, this is just not something we would have to worry about anymore. And yet there was this subtle difference. And you know, we're not talking about old middle-aged white guys. We're talking about a group of students only five years ago, you know, so not that dissimilar from yourselves. And you know, so, so my takeaway from that was, gosh, it's disappointing. I still, don't, I still don't personally feel that bias. I mean, I still think in terms of a gender bias, and, and maybe it's interesting that I've picked corporate governance because in corporate governance there is a, there is a strong uh, momentum and initiative towards having more women on board. So maybe I've actually picked a place where my gender is helpful to getting my foot in the door. Once my foot's in the door, if I'm only, there, if I'm only running on a diversity ticket, please don't give me that job because I'm not going to do a good job. They're not going to be happy with me. So it's, I actually hesitate a little when someone says, well, they need to put a woman on the board. Uh, and that's why they want to talk to you. But I still take the meeting, because you take the meeting for whatever reason, and then once you get there, you can say, well, is it, is, are they just trying to check a box? Or is it that they'd love to have a woman because, yes, it does check a box, but they're really only looking for someone who's, who's going to contribute and add value. And I think you can really tell that in the interviews. So let's hope that if they run the Heidi Howard test again in five years or some other equivalent case, you know, we'll just keep getting better and better. At this point in, in our careers, I know many of us are looking for mentors, so I'd love to hear how you've uh, found mentors and how helpful they've been to you in your career. So I think, it, again, it goes back to a little bit to that pen pal thing. I've tried doing the Stanford programs where I've mentored students here, and I have to admit, I, I don't sign up for them anymore just because I found it really didn't, we, you know, we can go walk and I can give you advice and that's sort of it, you know. Uh, the, the, the flip side is when you can find something to coalesce around, when you can, can find a, you know, an alumni student group where there's an activity or a conference or something like that that you can work on together, I find those work really well. For me, I really found my mentors in, in two places. One is in work where I was doing business with someone and decided they were a smart person and I wanted to attach myself to them. So, you know, if I think about my mentors, um, people like Ann Winblad, who I got to know early on and who we were Hummer Winblad's first investment, so then she was on my board. Uh, Bill Gates, who I, you know, worked with closely when, you know, and competed with way back in the beginning of, of the personal computer uh, revolution and, you know, got to know him and, and got to, to do some business with Microsoft and so got to know him better. Uh, other folks that, that I literally met here, you know, Fred Gibbons and Trip Hawkins and, and people that, that actually came and spoke to, 
to the business school, and then when I started my company, I would get in touch with them, and I ended up doing business with their companies. So that was a lot of the way I did it. The other thing is I decided to, and I strongly recommend this, I decided to get involved in the trade associations of the, org of the, of the industries I was in. So uh, early on in the personal computer industry, there was something called the Software Publishers Association, which was kind of funny because there weren't like, there weren't very many software publishers, so it was kind of funny that we had this this industry association. And in fact, the way I found out about it is we had this this user of one of our products, and she would call in all the time. and And she was in her, I don't know, 70s or 80s. She was she was not a young woman, um, and and personal computer user in 1983, 84. When you're in your 70s or whatever, that's really highly unusual. It's a lot more common now, but it wasn't then. And she would always say to me, my nephew Kenny is starting this group of people like you. And she just kept saying, you know, my nephew Kenny. And, and I thought, oh God, you know, this woman, you know, she, she seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. She lived in like a mobile home park in Utah or something. And she was telling me that her nephew Kenny was starting this software club or something. I thought, okay, fine, have your nephew Kenny call me. And it turned out that it was this guy Ken Wash in Washington, D.C. who started this thing called the Software Publishers Association. And so, I got involved with that, and then that grew and grew and became a, a very prominent organization. And I got involved in the leadership of that. I ran for, for the board, and I was elected to the board. And I ended up serving on that board for eight years. I was president for two. And then subsequently, I, was, I did the same thing with the National Venture Capital Association and rose onto the board, and I was actually elected um, chairman of that. Ultimately, I stepped down because I wasn't going to stay in venture capital, and I thought it would be really weird to be chairman of the National Venture Capital Association and not be a venture capitalist. So I proactively stepped down from that position, but I got elected. The, the thing about a trade association is, you know, there are a lot of work and you don't get paid to do them. But the connections you make and the contacts you make and your presence in the industry ends up being so much vaster and greater than whatever it might be merited by the size of your company alone. So, you know, T-Maker was this little piddly company that sort of nobody cared about, but yet I was on the board of the Trade Association and I got to testify before the Senate on the Software Rental Act. I got to go to Japan and rep represent the United States software industry. I got to do all these interesting things and I got to meet the other leaders of the software industry who were, you know, I was sitting on that board with people who had much, much bigger companies than I did and those were people who I ended up getting to know. The same thing with the NVCA. I ended up being on the board with other venture capitalists who had deal flow, right? Which is really nice and who had money to invest in my companies. And so I ended up doing business with those people. So I'm a big proponent of, of trade associations in spite of the fact that they are sort of bureaucratic and, 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 you know, and you don't get paid to do it and they're really long hours. But I really think that they benefit you. I, I think the other thing is it gets your head out of your own daily business. And I know, particularly in Silicon Valley, maybe not so much anymore, but back in the Stone Ages when I was starting a company, we really thought of Washington and government and the feds and all that as all those really stupid people on the other coast that just stay out of our way and leave us alone. And the more I got involved in trade associations, the more I started to understand the connection between government and governmental policy and what actually happens at my little company and my ability to create jobs and, and things like, um, uh, you know, visas and taxation and, and, and how they slice up uh, broadband and how they, how they regulate things really do impact your little company in ways that are rather alarming sometimes and rather wonderful sometimes if you can figure out how to be on the right side of that equation. So for me, it opened my eyes to a lot of things that, as a small entrepreneur, I would have said, oh, God, who cares what those people in Washington do anyway? Well, now I care a lot more about what those people in Washington do. There's a reason why, you know, Google and Microsoft and Cisco and whatever have offices and employees and all those sitting in Washington because it really, really, really matters. So I guess for our last question, what is the best piece of advice that you would give to MBA students to make the most out of their time at the GSB? Mm. What a great question. Um, well, <laughs> first of all, you're just in a, you're at a great school. I mean, and, and everybody will come here and talk and you get, you know, when I just look at the roster of people who are walking through here all the time, it's just remarkable. So take advantage of all that, number one. Uh, number two, each other. 
you know, so, and, and it isn't even just each other in this room or in the, in the years that you have here. It's the alums that came slightly before you. It's the students that will come slightly after you. It's, it's really, it's like being a member of the GSB and an alum of the GSB is like having that secret handshake and that sort of anybody will answer your email or, or you know, I mean, you really are part of this great thing that I would r recommend you continue to remain close to and continue to participate in things here because they will really, really pay back. In terms of the learning, the actual learning experience, um, <laughs> gosh. Uh, <laughs> You know, there are, there are classes I wish I had taken when I was here. There were a couple classes I took that were really hugely, I took negotiation, incredibly important class to me. Um, Power and Politics, Jeff Pfeffer's class, he's a great, he, he, he's one of the, the folks too that I you know, keep in touch with to this day. Um, it was important to take accounting because you gotta know that stuff. Um, and I, and uh, let's see, what was the other one? Negotiation, creativity, and business. Michael Ray's class was just fantastic. So there were a class, a few classes, and basic marketing was another one that that really got me, and I loved them. And boy, the list after that, I really can't even remember them. And and I remember sitting in some classes. In fact, my my thing used to always be, oh good lord, the Black Scholes, you know, capital asset pricing model. When in my life am I ever going to use this? Well, now I'm on the board of a public company, and guess what? They use that. So, <laughs> yay! I finally got to use it. Because when you're, you know, looking at enterprise value versus market cap, and 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 you're thinking about M&A, you actually have to have this way of saying, well, how are we really valued? How are our options valued? Black Scholes came up in this whole option pricing thing, so I finally had something useful from that class. Only 30 something years later, I did have to look it up again and figure out. <laughs> I still can't do it, but. But, uh, but, I would, but what I would tell you is, is when you have the opportunity to take classes that sound interesting to you, just take the ones that sound interesting to you. And I would, I would also have to say that I, I've done a lot of hiring in my, in my years. And I can't say that I've ever looked at someone's transcript or their GPA or anything like that. It's about what did you do when you were here? What did you take away? What kind of groups and clubs did you involve yourself with? That is the stuff that is much more important as an employer than, than GPA. And I, I'm sure there are organizations that look at grades. I, I've never been one of them. And, and in fact, there have been some studies that argue that there's a reverse, there, there's a, an inverse correlation between your GPA and your ability to actually work at like an entrepreneurial company. So all you low achievers, there's hope, there's hope. So now we're going to open it up to the audience, and we have two microphones that will be going around. So if you'll just raise your hand, and they'll come find you. Hi. Hi. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you manage your email, given <laughs> the volume of it that you get? I do it constantly. Uh, that's that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm a very active email user, and I I'm you know, and I'm always wired. I have it on all the time. And in fact, one of the things I'm trying to do is have the discipline to not look at it all the time because it is very addictive. And I, I just came from a, I was a, I'm on the board of I'm on the board of the Yellow Pages of Canada, which is actually I know you guys are probably laughing. Oh my God, why does she do that? Um, 1.6 billion a year in revenue, 900 million EBITDA, 700 million free cash flow last year. They do business with 46% of all businesses in Canada and 250 million of that revenue was online and they had 9 million uniques on their website, which by the way is, Canada doesn't really have that many people. <laughs> I mean, so, <laughs> Canada has, t what, what do they have, 20 something million, 30 million, you know, 35. so if you're, 30, thank you. I know, I was thinking, God, I'm on the board of a Canadian company. I, I don't know who the prime minister is, if they have one of those. I can't name all the provinces, provinces and territories, and I don't even know how many people they have, but I know it's about the size of California, so I figure, okay. But, but anyway, so, so the reason I joined that board is I thought, what an interesting challenge. This company, this company mints money, right? You know, I mean, that's more money than I ever saw in any of the venture deals I ever did. And yet they have this transformational thing. But the point being is I'm sitting in this board meeting and, and my iPhone is sitting there and it's like every time 
it's like so tempting to look at it, right? Especially when like audit committee's going on, because I hate audit committee. <laughs> and you have to just turn it over or put it away or you know, step away from it. Um, so email is, you know, it's a great boon and, and, it's a, and it's a terrible thing as well. And I find, you know, quick answers, real efficiency. I try, I am one of those people that I empty my in basket. I'm not one of those people that keeps the sedimentary layer of email that I don't want to deal with in my in basket. Um, and I try to just process it and deal with it. And you have to get really good at saying no about things and you have to be really efficient with how you do it. The, the thing I'm, I'm challenged with, frankly, right now is, so I, I did Twitter for a while. I, I never tweeted, but I, I went and I followed people and then I thought, oh, this is just, I'm not doing this. I couldn't find value in it. I'm not saying there isn't value for certain people in certain things, but for me, I didn't find it. Facebook, just keeping up on Facebook is just unbelievably hard. Now, part of it is my daughter says I'm a Facebook whore. She didn't actually use that word, but, but because I have like 3,000 friends on Facebook. And, and I did that because I have a consumer product, right? And so I want to be friends with everybody. But now, you know, I get on Facebook and it's like, you have 67 friend requests today. And, you know, you don't know these people. But now the problem is I, I have so many people that it, you'll come on and it says, you have 47 friends in common. And then I'll look at the 47 people. I don't really know any of them either. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm working on that. I'm working on that. LinkedIn, a little bit better because a little more business focused. But, but I find now when you say manage email, it isn't just email, right? It's Facebook and it's LinkedIn and it's Twitter and it's, and it's you know, wherever you happen to have presence and are trying to manage your presence. And so I definitely have, have there are things I've sort of opted out of like being part of the whole, you know, deeply, I'm not living a lot of my social life online, right? I, I, I don't because I, I haven't organized Facebook properly to really say, okay, who's the core group? I, I do spy on my children on Facebook, um, which they know. Hey, they friended me. It's not, you know, it's okay. When they unfriend me, that's going to be the problem. But I keep track of them online, which I think is kind of interesting. But other than that, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's hard. Email's hard. But I couldn't live without it. I, a, a couple weeks ago, I was having some work done on my house, and they were going to shut my water off for five hours, and then they had to shut my, my power down for some, some time. And I said, I'd rather live without water than without <laughs> connectivity. You know, I can manage around water, but the connectivity, I'm just going to go to Starbucks for five hours. You know. actually, um, actually, the Dutch Goose, because it's free. <laughs> Dutch Goose has free wireless, where Starbucks you have to pay. So. <laughs> Another important tip. All right, the case spoke about consistency and performance as the two main mm -hmm. elements of maintaining or mm -hmm. having a good network. Mm -hmm. uh, could you speak to how you actually define that and if those really are the two key elements? Yes, and, okay. and I do. I do think those are. Don't I sound consistent? <laughs> Don't I sound consistent? Very consistent, okay, very good. consistent. Good, I'm glad. Um, no, consistency, and, and believe me, I think about this as a parent a lot, is, you know, if one time you say yes and another time you say no and there's just randomness to it, people don't know what to expect from you. And I think that, that this goes with being genuine. Consistency is if you know you ask me something and I'm, I have a consistent set of rules I apply, then you know what you're going to get from me. And I think that that helps in building of relationships. People know if they ask me to do something, I'm either going to do it or I'm going to tell them I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to back burner it and, you know, and kind of hem and haw. And, you know, and, and, and like this person who asked me to, to endorse them, I emailed them back and I said, you know what, I really can't do that. I'm sure you were great, <laughs> but I only really do this for people that I had a direct you know, a direct relationship with where I could really say something specific. And if not, I just don't think it's valuable to have an endorsement out there. So good luck, but, you know, but I can't do it for you. So I think consistency, it just, it makes your life a lot easier. It makes you a known quantity to people. And I think it helps build your reputation as, you know, do what you say you're going to do. Performance, to me, goes hand in hand with that, right? If, if, if you're a person who constantly drops the ball and doesn't deliver, then Again, it's going to hurt your reputation. And for me, there are times I can't perform. There are times I just have to say, you know what, I have my, my priorities. And I think this is something that particularly recently has become very important to me, which is 
have a really firm idea in your head of what your priorities are, right? And, and if something, because it's very easy, particularly when you don't have a day job, to get sucked into whoever's asking for the most and whoever wants you to do something. And all of a sudden, you find out that you're really busy doing that and you're falling down on the things that are, that are important to you because they're not screaming as loud. Particularly when you have teenagers, believe me, they don't always ask to be like supervised. Uh, so you have to have time for those things. Taking care of yourself is another one. If you don't make it a priority, it ain't gonna happen. And so I've tried to do that. So performance to me is a matter, you know, consistency and performance go so much hand in hand. And letting people know, if you're going to do something, do it. If you're not gonna do something, be clear that you're not gonna do it. If you don't have the time frame, if you can only give to a certain level of, of whatever you're gonna do. If you're only gonna participate in, in something to a certain level, be really clear about that because the worst thing to do is, is the old overcommit and underdeliver. And I'd rather undercommit and overdeliver. So I think there is a constant, you know, I, I'd say an audit of your own um, activities is also really important. I did this thing a couple months ago where I just looked at my calendar and I said, how am I spending my time? And I added it all up and said, okay, what does this tell me about about me. And my tendency is I'm a responder. If somebody, you know, I've used this, this line before, if a total stranger called me up and said, could you pick me up at SFO in a half an hour, I'd really debate that I probably ought to go do that. Um, and so I'm bad about when people ask me for things, I have a hard time saying no. And I think sometimes you have to develop no muscles. You know, you have to be able to say, you know what, I'm not gonna do that. And it's not that it isn't a worthy cause. Right, but you have to set some boundaries. And, and you know, again, to use a Bill Gates example, one of my boundaries is I never forward requests for philanthropy to Bill, right? I don't care who it is or how worthy they are. Um, or Jeff Rakes, who I know was a view from the top speaker here and, and is a good friend of mine and runs the Gates Foundation. I just have a rule. I don't care how good you are. You know what? GatesFoundation.org, they have a whole thing about their priorities and their initiatives. and how to submit, and you should do that. And if I had my own charity, I wouldn't ask Bill or Jeff for money. Because when, if you don't put boundaries like that, then it becomes a slippery slope. And all of a sudden, it's like you become the intermediary having to make these evaluative decisions. I don't want to be there. And so sometimes you, you put these boxes around things and say, That's, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to audit my time. I'm going to think about who you know, the, the flip side of this is if, if all you're doing is reacting and you're just spending time with the people who want to spend time with you, you might be missing out on the people that you really want or need to spend time with. And so another thing that I'm thinking about a lot recently is who are those friends who really mean something to me and spend time with those friends, which means that, you know, there's only 24 hours a day. You gotta turn off some other things in order to be open to new experiences, in order to be open to physical exercise, in order to be open to having the time to spend with, with people that, that are meaningful to you. That comes from somewhere else and you have to have the ability to turn those other things off. It's a constant battle and a constant adjustment. Yeah. Heidi, thanks. Thanks for being here. Sure. I had a question for you. Um, could you talk a little bit about Skinny Songs? What inspired you to start it, and what are you trying to achieve? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, it's really funny. I was at, at this Yellow Pages board meeting. I was talking about buying Google AdWords. You know, this is the funny thing. like you never think in a million years. Well, because I was a sole proprietor, and I did this weight loss thing, and I went on Google AdWords, and I was buying AdWords, and I learned some really interesting things about buying AdWords that are now really useful to me sitting on the board of this multi-billion dollar company. But I brought this thing up in the board meeting about you know, when, when you buy the words weight loss, for example, the words weight loss are so expensive on a cost per click basis that, you know, they, it was like $10 to buy the word weight loss, weight loss as a search term, and my product only sells for $9.99. So trust me, there is no business model that makes that an effective strategy. Um, and then I decided I was going to buy all the names of all my songs, erroneously thinking that people would hear a song and want to go look it up. Well, one of the songs has the word hottie in it. Let me tell you, I bought the keyword hottie. I got a ton of traffic on my site. None of them were my target audience. <laughs> and so I learned some really interesting things about buying AdWords and what happens in search engine you know, marketing. All that. So it was really interesting. But you know, long story short, really, really simple. I wasn't taking care of myself. I gained a, a lot of weight. Um, two and a half, three years ago, I was 40 pounds more than I am right now. 
and I was looking for motivation to, <coughs> to lose weight. And I was, I've always been a person who loves listening to music and, you know, chick empowerment songs. And I was looking for that kind of stuff online. And, and I went on iTunes and I looked around and there was meditation for weight loss. There were a lot of podcasts about weight loss. There, but there weren't any songs like, you know, the, the equivalent of Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive, right? You break up with a guy and you listen to that song over and over and over and over again. And you're like, yeah. I will. <laughs> and I wanted the, I will survive without eating the plate of chocolate, chocolate chip cookies they're going to have at the meeting today. And so that was why I did it. Um, I didn't know where it would take me, but I, I'll tell you what I learned from this. First of all, don't go in the music business. It's not a very good place to make money. The creative process was super fun, though, and I ended up getting to work with some just amazing people, and I talked this one guy, David Malloy, into doing it with me. And the first time I talked to him, he said, Okay, so you live in Silicon Valley, you're a venture capitalist, I don't even know what that is. He's Reba McIntyre's producer, he's Julianne Howe, or Huff, however you say her last name, he's her producer. He's, he's got 40 number one hits, he's got five Grammy nominations, he's a big dog, right? He's like a go-to man in Nashville. He says, I don't even know what a venture capitalist is, you've never written a song in your life, you don't play an instrument, and you want to write music for fat chicks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to write... Music that inspires women to, to achieve their weight loss and fitness goals. And he goes, uh, I don't know, that's pretty weird. But send me, the, send, me the, send me the lyrics. So I sent him the lyrics. And the next day he called me and he said, I don't know, I still don't get it. But I took it home, I showed it to my wife. And she said, this is what women talk about all day long. So, um, so he agreed to do one song with me, one song. And by the end of it, he, he had, had co-written seven of the songs. He produced six of them for me. And he told me at the end of the project it was the most fun he's ever had on any project because when, when he's dealing with Reba McIntyre or Kenny Rogers or, or you know any of these big name people, they come in and they really have a very strong idea. Me, I came in with my lyrics and I said, I want this to sound like Carrie Underwood or Rascal Flats or Pink or the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> and that's all I know here. And, and, and that's literally what I did. And then he, you know, he said to me, you know, you write poetry. We need lyrics. And I said, well, what's the difference? And he said, well, you know, you tend to write, I'm going to do something, I do it, I did it. And lyrics are, I do it, I do it, I do it. Because people want to sing along. And they don't want to know, like, am I in the beginning of the song? Am I in the middle? Am I in the end? You know, so he would shorten everything. And then he would send me MP3s where he was strumming on the guitar, just singing and, and wherever my words didn't fit, he'd go da, 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 da. And then he'd say, well, now you have to rewrite it. And then I would have to rewrite it. But we would have these huge fights about like one word. Because to me, I was champion of the, of the lyrics. I said, if the lyrics, I'm all about the lyrics. I'm all about music that sounds as good as pop radio. Because if it didn't, you wouldn't listen to it. And then these, these lyrics have to be meaningful. And, and you, can't, you can't change my lyrics. So I had, a, I had a one funny thing. He was out of town and he left his, it was the last song and I was desperately waiting for it. And it was the only song in which I mentioned dress sizes. And he was out of town. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. It's the last song. It comes in on a Friday night, his, his, his guy, that, his co-writer. And I fire it up and listen to it. And they had changed the dress size from 16 to 17. Because... <laughs> The male producer thought 17 was a prettier sounding number. I'm like, there is no dress size 17. <laughs> That's why you guys can't change the lyrics. So we had to go and do it all over again. So the coolest thing, what I'll say about that is, is there, are, there are two great things. One great thing is you cannot promote a weight loss product and be overweight. So I had to lose weight because I was going to go on. I've been, I've been on the Martha Stewart show, and I've been on CNN, and I've been on... CNBC, and I've, I've been on Donnie Deutsch, and I did a bunch of television. And you cannot hold up a product and say, well, it didn't actually work for me, <laughs> but I hope you will like it. So first of all, it's been really helpful, and I've had to, you know, I've lost weight and, and, and exercise, and you know, I'm happy with, with all that. And promoting a product really helped. I mean, it really does help. The other thing is, well, three things. The second thing is I got to do this amazing creative process and learn about songwriting and the greatest compliment David Malloy paid me at the end of it is he said have you ever thought of writing for other 
for not for fat chicks, I guess. He said, you'd be a great lyricist. He goes, you know, I've worked with all, a lot of lyricists, and you'd be a great lyricist. I'm like, thank you. I mean, there's no money in it, but, but I was very pleased that somebody who's, you know, that big a dude would actually want to work with me on things other than that. So the creative process was great. And, and then the final thing is, I get fan mail every once in a while from someone who says, your music helped change my life. And that's really cool. When you get something from someone who says, I was really struggling, and then I got your CD, and it just was the thing that helped me. And it put, I, ha I got one from a woman a couple weeks ago. She lost 200 pounds. And she said when she got to about 140, she just couldn't get anywhere, couldn't get anywhere, and then somebody gave her my CD. And it really helped her. And so that kind of stuff is just, I mean, that just makes your day, right, when, when you get something like that. So I'm really glad I did it. It's, it's profitable now. That's because we pay the CEO no money. And, um, and so I, I sell just enough CDs to pay all the expenses of the business and keep it up and running. And, you know, I'm really proud of it. I'm really glad I did it. Am I going to do any more? Probably not. But, um, but it was, it's really fun, really different. And it really has taught me a lot about being a small business because I'm – I'm on iTunes, I'm on Amazon, I'm an Amazon affiliate associate, I use fulfillment by Amazon, I've bought Google AdWords. And so in a funny way, having this little inky, dinky business made me go do a bunch of stuff that's really valuable to know sitting at the other end of the spectrum now on, on the board of the Yellow Pages, I can really relate to the small business owner because I had to do a lot of that stuff myself. Do you have time for one more question? So uh, in the case, um, it talked a little bit about your uh, way, to, way to connect with people. And as you mentioned, with the women's conference, and out of 300 people, you sought 10. At a cocktail party, what goes through your mind when you meet that person the first time? I mean, is it, I stalked you on the internet? Here's what I found out. <laughs> or you know, how do you think Well, the so process? that's the thing. And I, and I think that's the, the – you're bringing up the really interesting question between – being this sort of like stalkerazzi person who's, you know, who's in there with an agenda versus just going and wanting to meet interesting people, right? And I think, you know, sometimes, you know, obviously, if you walk into a room and you know that the VP of marketing for Coca-Cola is there and that TiVo has this amazing stuff about uh, Coca-Cola ad efficacy that you'd like the VP of marketing to know about, maybe you're going to go find that person. On the other hand, you might just say, wow, here's a person I've always wanted, you know, recently, um, there was a person who wanted me to meet with Sherry Lansing about something. And I've always wanted to meet Sherry Lansing. So of course I took the meeting, even if I wasn't that interested in the thing necessarily. I, well, it wasn't that I wasn't interested, but, but there was a, a big piece of the draw was I was going to get to meet Sherry Lansing. And she would be a per, she's a person I respect a lot, and she's you know, done a tremendous amount in film and with cancer awareness and research, and so I just wanted to meet her. So I don't know what, what goes on in your mind. It isn't so much that I have an agenda and I'm trying to, to – usually it isn't that I have an agenda. Usually it's I love knowing interesting people. And um, I generally find if you get to know other interesting people, interesting things happen in your life. And so – I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like it's that methodical. I will say this, and, and this is one of those, if you, if you really want to know how to succeed in the when you get out of business school, my takeaway from my last year, and I'll close on this, is homework never stops. You always have to do homework. And the more you just accept that and say, I don't care how big and powerful and important you get, at the end of the day, if you also do a little homework, and I've learned this in, in going for board interviews, no matter how much... I'm a great fit and my background looks great or, or they read my case in business school so they think I'm famous. Um, if you walk in and you haven't read the annual report, combed the website, known the background of the people, know what school everybody went to, know what their hobbies, you know, go learn about the people you're meeting with and don't just presume that your natural talent and grace and wonderfulness is going to carry you through an interview because what I've learned and, and now that I'm on a board, you know, my goal on these boards I serve on is I want the CEO at the end of the year when he looks around and says, who contributed the most to this company from the board? I want to be that person, right? I don't want to just be there and be the token girl on the board or the, you know, whatever. I want to go in there and I want to do such an awesome job because I want to do boards for the next 20 years or whatever. And when that CEO gets called, I want him to you know, say, oh my god, she's fantastic. And that takes homework. And believe me, reading, <laughs> reading SEC filings is not that fun. <laughs> but it's part of the homework, 
right? And, and you know, and, and so homework, that's all I'll, I'll close with that is, I'm sorry to tell you this, but homework never ends. But thanks to the internet, you can at least do it at home in your pajamas. So. <laughs>